Okay, so we've covered the credit risks and the various stages up to now that form the basis of our general approach when it comes to the impairment model. Now, IFRS 9 accepts that there are certain companies with, for instance, a lot of trade receivables or many lease receivables, and to now go and evaluate the increase or the change in credit risk for each of these items. Um, if you just think about an Edgar's or a Truworths, the number of trade receivables that they have, um, it is quite time consuming, it's costly to then evaluate for each customer, for each trade receivable that what happened in the credit risk since initial recognition. It can be very a very costly exercise. So IFRS 9 accepts that and therefore allows for a simplified approach um, for certain items. Okay, so first it allows trade receivables and contract assets. It's those assets in terms of IFRS 15 uh, without a significant financing component to always be measured at lifetime expected credit losses. So you actually don't need to determine the credit risk stage of the asset because the loss allowance is always recognized um, equal to lifetime expected credit losses. So you don't have to make an assessment, is this trade receivable in credit risk stage one, two, or three? What had happened to the credit risk? You don't have to do it. You can just recognize the uh, loss allowance equal to lifetime expected credit losses. Okay, so where you have a trade receivable, a contract asset, or a lease um, receivable with a financing component, then you have a choice. You can either apply the approach that we have discussed, stage one, two, and three, or you can choose to do or apply lifetime ECL. Okay. So for the first scenario here, we have a trade receivable without a significant components. There's no choice. You have to make sure that your loss allowance equals lifetime ECL. But with the second one here, here you have an accounting policy choice. You can decide to rather go the, the more complicated route and say, okay, are you assess for the trade receivables, what happened with the credit risk, and then determine the credit risk stage, and based on that, you determine the loss allowance. Or you can simply choose to say, okay, I'm, I want my loss allowance to always um, be equal to lifetime ECL. Okay, and you can do this for each type of um, asset, or so you can do it. You can maybe group certain trade receivables per geographic region, region, and determine the 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 life. Um, the uh, you can apply the policy choice to those specific regions or only to some. Okay, so it is independently for each type of asset. Okay, and that is a simplified approach that is allowed. So look out in a question, um, especially if you have trade receivables, contract assets, and lease receivables. Remember to look in the question if the simplified approach is possibly applied before you go into a whole lot of detail, assessing credit risk, etc., etc. So look out for words like, for instance, a trade receivable contract asset without a significant, significant finance component. When you see something like that, then you know they can apply the simplified approach. Where you see a trade receivable contract asset and lease receivable with a, a significant financing component, look out for a, the sentence that tells you what is the policy of the company. Okay, so you need to look out for these things in a question to make sure that you approach it correctly.